From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Here's what's coming up. K-State's Jeff Whitworth will report on wireworm and rootworm activity in corn stands around Kansas, and if control measures are necessary, Jeff will also advise you alfalfa growers on dealing with potato leafhopper damage to your stands. Also today, we have highlights from the latest Kansas Forest Service podcast. K-State's Andy Klein and Jaron Tyndall will talk about tree plantings as part of riparian area management to reduce stream bank and crop field erosion from high water events. And of course, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven will check in with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. All that and more straight ahead on Agriculture Today. For information on threatening weather, you should depend on the National Weather Service and their broadcast on NOAA Weather Radio. NOAA Weather Radio is an all-hazards radio network that provides up-to-the-minute weather information, including life-saving warnings anytime, day or night. NOAA Weather Radio also broadcasts information on man-made disasters, such as chemical spills, amber alerts, or other national emergencies. For the National Weather Service, I'm Bill Curtis. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. And for starters here, we'll talk about insects. At work in a couple of our leading field crops in Kansas, namely corn and alfalfa, with the latest is Jeff Whitworth. He's a crop entomologist with K-State Research and Extension, as you know. Jeff, welcome back. And as to the corn stands out there, you say there could well be worm issues, including that old nemesis, the corn rootworm. What's the update? Yes, and good morning. Uh, glad to be back. I have started receiving some calls about three and four leaf stage corn or maybe a little further uh, along that are showing signs of wireworm and white grub feeding damage. And I've been out and checked some of the fields. There is a little bit of wireworm and white grub feeding going on. And a lot of the growers are concerned that the insecticides that the seed was treated with at the factory is not holding up. But pretty much that's not the case. Uh, The seed treatment insecticides are good for 21 to 28 days, basically, from the time that seed is put into the ground. A lot of folks think it's from the time it starts to germinate, but it's not. It's once it's planted in the furrow, the clock starts on the uh, seed treatment. So wireworms will feed on the roots, but they also feed on the young germinating plant in the stem. So um, that's what we're seeing, and I think that's primarily the reason is because of just the timing of when the the planting occurred versus when the infestation occurred. So what can one do about that in that we're in midstream, so to say? Uh, Really nothing right now. I mean, it it should outgrow it. I I don't think you're going to... I've seen a few thin stands, but no stands that were wiped out altogether. Now, you know, back in the, that's a good question, back in the 90s, in the early 2000s, we would see quite a few stands wiped out, but there were no seed treatments in at all used. Now that we're using seed treatment, at least it helps protect some of the plants. So you'll see some feeding damage around the stem. You may see a a thinning, you know, where a, a plant has died here and there. But for the most part, you're going to get a stand. And really, at this point in time, unless it's to the point where you have to replant, there's no uh, rescue treatment or or anything you can do about that right now. But by the same token, we've looked at several fields of continuous corn planted to susceptible varieties as far as corn rootworms go. And the 3rd of June, we found our first corn rootworm larva, a real small first instar had just hatched out. All of the um, resistant varieties we have now, the BT uh, varieties that everybody's using that are resistant to corn rootworms, the seed treatments. Seed treatments help on corn rootworms, but again, it's a timing thing because if if the corn was planted back in early to mid-April, that insecticide has dissipated now. So when the corn rootworm eggs hatch uh, and they crawl over and find the roots, essentially, or the stem, uh, they can start feeding on it, and insecticide is not going to help. We are starting to see just a little bit of resistance. We have actually data to show that 
all the BT resistant varieties to corn rootworms have populations of corn rootworms that are resistant to them, uh, and that just goes with overuse of pesticides for the most part. So rotation still works, but susceptible continuous cornfields we're monitoring, uh, and we did find our first corn rootworm, western corn rootworm larva, and that brings up a point because I have found quite a few southern corn rootworm adults around. Those are the oh, kind of lime green with black spots. Insects are very common. Sometimes they're called the 12-spotted cucumber beetle, and a lot of times folks get excited about those, especially when they find them in soybeans or alfalfa, but they don't cause an impact on our corn. They'll feed on pollen. They may do a little leaf feeding, but they, they don't bother the roots. It's only the well, for the most part, it's only the western corn rootworm in Kansas that we have a problem with. So the western, they're just hatching out. So you might want to watch your um, your cornfields oh, for the next two to three weeks. And if you start seeing uh, wobbly corn, the wind's starting to blow, and it looks like the stem is about ready to topple over, might pull up a few of those plants and check the root systems. Probably has some uh, root feeding and those little white worms hanging off of it with a dark spot at both ends, that's a corn rootworm. There are some products out there that you can do a lay-by treatment, they call it, or a, a furrow treatment, where you can put it right down beside the plant and then incorporate it, cover it up a little bit with uh, soil and hope for rain or irrigate it in uh, so it gets down to the root system and will help control the rootworms that are feeding actively in the on the root system. But before you do that, go out and pull some plants to make sure they are. It is a larval rootworm that's feeding because that lay buyer, that um, treatment is a little difficult. It's a little expensive, and you got to hit it just at the right time because otherwise these things are going to pupate. That means they're not going to feed anymore, and they've already done all the feeding. So you just need to get out and check. Be aware if you have a three-plus-year continuous cornfield that you may have some corn rootworms uh, out there. We always do in Kansas, so they're very common. So corn growers, scout your stands now. See if corn rootworms are in fact present, causing problems. You're hearing about pests in alfalfa, but beyond the weevils now, Jeff, potato leaf hoppers are out there, you say. Yes, again, the alfalfa has been or is just being swath, it seems like, from what I've seen the last week, uh, which is a good thing. We've had real problems around the state with the alfalfa weevil, as we do every year. It's our number one pest in alfalfa. Uh, If you don't generally treat for alfalfa weevils prior to that first cutting, you've donated a big portion of that first cutting to the alfalfa weevil. Uh, Most alfalfa growers realize that now. But then we always have issues with weather that impacts alfalfa weevil treatments and et cetera. But the alfalfa weevils from what I've seen in south central and north central Kansas are done as far as the larval feeding goes. Alfalfa weevils are cool weather insects. Uh, As soon as the temperatures hit 80, 85 degrees, they pretty much leave these fields or they at least go into the the residue under the fields and where it's cooler and they don't bother the crop anymore. What we are seeing right now is the buildup of potato leaf hoppers. Potato leaf hopper is a problem in alfalfa every year. I think that is underappreciated. They migrate in right now between the first and the second cutting or in June and July. Uh, and that's what we're seeing. All the, all the potato leaf hoppers that we've picked up this last week were adults. So they lay their eggs in the stems. Those, those eggs hatch. The little potato leaf hoppers emerge and they'll start feeding, uh, sucking juice from the plant. When you go out into the field, they'll crawl to their, their kind of hop or move herky jerky to the underneath side of a leaf or go to the stem where a lot of times they're not noticed. But if you take a sweep net out, that's the best way to sample for uh, potato leaf hoppers. The treatment threshold is very low because they remove the juice from the plant. But as they're doing, they also uh, introduce a toxin. And this toxin can cause problems, uh, especially in July, August, right? In Kansas, it's hot and dry. So not only the removal of the juice, but the introduction of the toxin can cause problems with alfalfa. And it starts out, the symptoms are first kind of a yellowing around the the tips of the leaves. And then that yellowing will move down the leaf. And then if it gets bad enough, it'll move down the stem. Um, and it can actually decrease the quantity 
of the alfalfa that's produced and the quality or the nutritional value of it also. So you can kind of get a double whammy. So that really is incumbent upon the producer to respond to just about any level of potato leaf hopper appearance. The potato leaf hopper has a very low treatment threshold. Yes, if you have two or three per 10 sweeps of a sweep net, you probably need to consider some sort of management tactic. Now, the best one, if you're within two weeks of swathing your field or cutting your field, do that because you'll remove the eggs. Remember, the eggs are in the stem. The nymphs are right there. They can't fly. They can't hop very far. The adults, they can fly, and they will. But primarily what's what's going to cause problems are the nymphs because there's lots of nymphs in these stems. They all emerge, and there can be two or three generations. So if you can, get out within, like I said, 10 days to 14 days of swathing. And if you hit the treatment threshold for uh, tail leaf hoppers, cut it. They don't feed on the uh, the processed alfalfa or the stored alfalfa when you put it in the barn or whatever. They have to have the living plant because they feed on the juice. And from what I've seen over the last 20 years, if you do swath these, they don't seem to migrate back into the field. They don't seem to reinfest the field uh, at the same level. Now, you'll still find a few, but once you've swathed it the first time, you generally are pretty well managing that population once you've cut the alfalfa. But if you spray the field, they're really easy to kill. Everything that we've tested, and we've tested them over the years, uh, and with the insecticides that are labeled for potato leaf hopper, they all work really well. And I've never seen a field reinfested that was sprayed for potato leaf hopper at the lowest rate that is labeled for that. Potato leaf hoppers, they're just moving back into the state, so get out and monitor your alfalfa for these little potato leaf hoppers. Just cause for being alert to those. Look for them in your stands. And always appreciate the update from the field. Thanks for coming over. We'll have you back again soon. My pleasure. Thank you. Jeff Whitworth, crop entomologist, K-State Research and Extension, with us on this part of agriculture today. And we'll be back on the K-State Radio Network. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State Research and Extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans in more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and now for you, thoughts on controlling erosion along our stream banks in Kansas. The riparian areas around streams and rivers were put to the test last year over a significant part of the state because of the high waters from excessive rains. On the latest KFS podcast from the Kansas Forest Service here at K-State, the service's two watershed foresters talked about using tree and ground cover plantings to reduce erosion loss. Jaron Tyndall and Andy Klein visit with the podcast moderator, Cassie Wondersee. What are some of the conservation goals that you see with landowners? What are they concerned about when it comes to their stream banks? Well, they don't like erosion. That's that's a real simple one. And when they see things change, for instance, uh, a bend in a creek moves a little bit further every year, and in some bad flood years, they see that it takes out several rows of their crop. That really concerns them. And they have an idea of just wanting to make their land better. And that's usually kind of an unformulated ideal. So whenever I show up, I find myself kind of fleshing those concerns out a bit and um, kind of balancing how much they dislike the idea of erosion with some information on how streams work and that in most of Kansas where we have these streams that are in a pretty degraded state, they've cut down much deeper than they would have been pre-settlement. They contain a lot more flood water within their banks, which means there's a lot more energy to do erosion. Part of their process of healing is to widen themselves and create a new floodplain at a lower elevation. Uh, Whereas the old floodplain used to be what's currently a farm field, 
they need to make one at a, a much lower level that would be contained within the tall banks that we see now, but functioning for itself as a stream ought to, and trying to decide where it makes sense to protect a stream bank and prevent that process from happening, that's, that's a tough one. Um, because it's a natural process, the streams are bound to go through, and figuring out when that's okay and when it's not, it's pretty tough, especially when most of our work is above federal reservoirs that are having sedimentation issues, and there's a, a public concern with losing state-owned storage in those reservoirs. So it's worth Kansan's investment to keep those reservoirs functional, which again makes stream bank erosion a bad thing, even though it's a natural thing. So it's a bit complex once you get into it. So Andy, I know you've been working a lot on those larger rivers, and could you maybe just talk to us a little bit about what that sedimentation looks like on those those large reservoirs? Yeah, this past year has been super interesting. Um, unfortunately, in some cases, in a lot of cases, devastating. Um, but really interesting to watch how Jaron was kind of describing those natural processes, the rivers, how it's natural for them to move a little bit. And that's why we have oxbow lakes and, you know, these, these old bends and wetlands and stuff in, in big river bottoms. And seeing the impacts of flooding this past year, there was kind of two types of flooding that happened. There was the typical flooding we kind of think of where, you know, it's this kind of wall of water rushing through, scouring things out, tearing trees and buildings and fences and road culverts and everything up. So there was some of that, and then there was also what I describe as backwater flooding, where uh, once, you know, flood water started filling in and the reservoirs started filling in, then all that water just started rising up and up and up slowly. So down along the Cottonwood and Neosho rivers in primarily Lyon County, there was kind of more of the scouring, and to see that impact, to see how much topsoil was lost in crop fields in spots is just mind boggling. Basically in, in some spots where all the topsoil got stripped off the field or a portion of the field, then you're down to some kind of poor subsoil there. Meanwhile, then that topsoil is deposited as sediment somewhere else where it's this big mucky mess in, uh, in the field and takes a long time to dry out. So that was interesting to see all that scouring down there along the Cottonwood River. And that was kind of the same case along the Delaware River and its tributaries. Then the Big Blue and Little Blue River, that was a little bit of scouring up on the, in the north ends of Marshall and Washington counties. But the bigger impacts I saw in those rivers was with uh, backwater from Tuttle Reservoir filling up to you know, historic high levels. And so all that water, you know, as it fills in and fills up, it spreads out. And that water is actually pretty slow. So it wasn't destructive in the same way that that scouring flood water was. But that's where some of that sediment settled out. In some cases, I saw about two feet of sediment that was deposited on a field. So you know, impacts to cropland where, where farmers had to think about how does this impact their cropping system. I know a, a lot of farmers were just kind of wringing their hands trying to figure out, well, how do we handle this? What are we going to do with this sediment this year? I think folks are getting it figured out, but that timber loss is, is going to take a while to get that figured out. The unfortunate impacts there long term is that all those big mature trees that have weakened root systems and just not doing very well now, they're going to start tipping over and become a problem in crop fields and potentially, you know, could be a problem in the river. So yeah, lots of different types of impacts and some of them are yet to be seen. But the, the sediment being deposited, the interesting thing is we got a cereal rye cover crop established on a couple tree planting sites and that one where there was two feet of sediment deposited in, and that cereal rye did fantastic. It just grew so well, just a wonderful, thick, lush stand of cereal rye. So that's, you know, some firsthand demonstration of what has made 
Kansas river bottom and creek bottom land so rich and productive is that flooding and sediment deposition has happened naturally for years and years and years and years and years and um, you know has, has helped create good healthy productive topsoil for us so in a way you know it's it's really bittersweet to see some of those impacts because they're destructive in the short term but hopefully there's a little bit of a silver lining that maybe in the long term they'll they'll help you know just kind of keep that natural process of soil creation and, and good healthy topsoil going and it really makes me think about what people can do to help mitigate that risk of flooding or reduce sedimentation in reservoirs yeah well i guess what that makes me think of are some investments that municipal governments are making in the management of the upper watersheds for instance wichita sends money into the Cheney Reservoir watershed and invests in water quality improvements. Their issue isn't so much tied to flooding, I think. Um, it's more about nutrient issues. So when a city has a vested interest in the quality of the water, they can put some of their money towards conservation in the form of cost share to farmers to do conservation practices. And I expect that that can be cheaper than building new and better water treatment plants. And in the case of flooding in these other watersheds, it could be that similar investments for the sake of flood mitigation could be made. And what might be useful is to plant wider riparian corridors. So that's trees, shrubs, native vegetation next to all the streams, well, above them, wherever that is, whether it's above a reservoir or just above a town. So the fields would be flooded for a longer period of time because the water wouldn't be moving so fast because it was slowed down by tree stems and shrubs and soaking into the ground a bit more but mostly just slowed down on its way down the valley so that's that's probably the simplest it also takes a lot of space so it's going to be challenged which is kind of ties back into the whole concept of government involvement with conservation is that we provide cost share we provide technical advice to make those challenges less significant for the landowners and our motivation is a, a broader public uh, benefit. It's, it is about that land and the landowner, but we're investing because it's also about us. Yeah. Like Jaren's saying, like those long-term investments are not cheap. Get involved with local and county and state and federal policy, you know, let your policymakers, your elected officials know how you feel about, uh, water quality and water quantity and natural resources management in general. Let them know your opinions on it so they can help craft and uh, enact policy that's going to be favorable towards water quality kind of stuff. So yeah, get in, in contact with your local legislators and uh, seek out and find how you can kind of support conservation in general. From the Kansas Forest Service here at Kansas State University, Andy Klein, Jaron Tyndall, and Cassie Wandersee. Contact the service about generating ideas on stream bank and watershed stabilization on your place. You can start by going to kansasforests.org, where you'll find the entire podcast, by the way, kansasforests.org. And this is Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. You're tuned in to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Welcome back. Eric Atkinson here as we go on now to today's agricultural news headlines for you, courtesy in part of DTN. 
The Kansas Department of Agriculture sent out a statement yesterday on the dicamba herbicide issue. On Monday, the Environmental Protection Agency issued the final cancellation order for those three dicamba products in response to the recent court ruling that vacated registration for the products. The EPA's cancellation order intended to clarify the limited and specific circumstances under which the products can be used for a limited period of time. That included provisions for existing stocks. Now, the KDA has identified several unanswered questions about how this order applies to Kansas farmers and agribusinesses. It's in communication with the EPA for further interpretation. But that EPA cancellation order addresses the sale, distribution, and use of existing stocks of Ingenia, Fexapan, and Extendamax. Under this cancellation order, the further distribution or sale of all existing stocks of those products is allowed only to the end user. Such distribution and sales can only be made by Kansas Restricted Use Pesticide Dealers. If growers, commercial applicators, and agribusinesses have these products in their possession, end use applications may still occur, provided that all label restrictions are followed. All use then will be cut off by July the 31st. If you have more questions about this, you can contact the KDA Pesticide and Fertilizer Program at 785-564-6688. That's 785-564-6688. Or keep checking their website for further updates, agriculture.ks.gov, agriculture.ks.gov. Yesterday, Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa credited the Department of Justice for beginning what he called sweeping initiatives for the country's four largest meat packers. Speaking to reporters during his weekly call, Grassley said the department investigation into packers, in his words, is a very important step to protect independent producers, but more must be done, again in his words. Bloomberg first reported last week that the department had issued subpoenas against the four large packers. Attorneys for the packers in a federal civil court hearing on Monday acknowledged receiving requests for information from the Department of Justice. President Trump was among those who called on the department to investigate packer actions this spring when the COVID-19 cases began to shut down packing plants. The price of boxed beef hit record highs for packers, while cattle prices fell at the same time for producers. Grassley says he intends to follow up with a letter to USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue seeking a report on the investigation into the Tyson Foods fire in Holcomb, southwest Kansas, last summer. It caused a widespread between cash cattle prices and boxed beef prices. Now, Grassley and a handful of other senators also introduced legislation last month that would require each packing plant to buy at least 50 percent of their cattle through negotiated cash trade sales. Since the legislation was introduced, groups such as the American Farm Bureau Federation and National Cattlemen's Beef Association each have issued statements and analyses criticizing the bill as attempts to limit the way that producers can market their cattle. In related news, the USDA issued a news release yesterday updating the production capacity status at meat packing plants now. Here's more from the USDA's Gary Crawford. The situation for the nation's hog, poultry, and beef cattle producers looking better now as a result of meat processing plants increasing their output, so much so that as a whole they are approaching pre-COVID output levels. Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue said in a statement Monday that livestock processing plants are as a whole turning out product at more than 95% of what they were doing this time a year ago. He said beef plants are at 98% of year-ago levels, poultry 98, pork plants at 95%. He said this progress was made possible due to a combination of actions all the way from the White House down to local health and safety officials and what Purdue called the patriotic, heroic plant employees across the country. And as he has done before, the secretary continues to thank everyone involved in the business of food. From the producers and the ranchers to the processors and the packers to our overall logistical system that uh, helped deliver that to the tables of families here in the United States. And continues to do so. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. 
Biofuel leaders praised 44 members of Congress who wrote a bipartisan letter to President Trump asking him to reject those states' demands for EPA to waive the 2020 Renewable Fuel Standard volume requirements. The Renewable Fuels Association, Growth Energy, and the National Biodiesel Board each sent out news releases about the letter from the Congressional Biofuels Caucus. The letter from House members also comes after 24 senators wrote a comparable letter last month to the president. The governors of Iowa, Minnesota, Nebraska, and South Dakota all wrote similar letters back in April. So far, the governors of Louisiana, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, Texas, Utah, and Wyoming have written the EPA asking for waivers, and so far there's no clear indication from EPA when the agency will rule on those waivers. Granting the waivers would undermine the RFS, compounding some of the challenges facing rural America right now, according to the House members in their letter. Among those who were signing off on that letter, Representative Roger Marshall of the state of Kansas. Well, wheat markets will get some new information this week about the size of crops here and abroad, plus new forecasts for exports and prices. Once more, with an update on that, the USDA's Gary Crawford. Coming up this Thursday, the next monthly round of USDA reports and forecasts, and we should know from those a lot more about prospects for U.S. wheat growers. USDA's Outlook Board Chairman Mark Chekanowski says first, the USDA Statistics Service will have an updated forecast for the U.S. winter wheat crop now in the early stages of harvest. He says his analysts will then be forecasting wheat supplies, exports, stocks, and prices based on that U.S. forecast, but also looking at wheat production in northern hemisphere, especially Europe and uh, the Black Sea region. A lot of those areas have had some poor weather, drought in in recent months, but then more, you know, timely rains in some parts recently. So we're going to be digging through all of that weather data and satellite data to see what it tells us or implies to us about the size of of those competing wheat crops. We'll get USDA's take on that and more Thursday noon Eastern time. Gary Crawford reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And, of course, on Friday's regular segment on the grain market trends, K-State's Dan O'Brien will dissect those new numbers from the USDA out tomorrow. K-State's Gus Vanderhoven is standing by with his weekly Stop, Look, and Listen. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus. So if you have a fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going in. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. There is a lot of wisdom in those 12 chapters. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. The Manhattan Mercury on Sunday, May 24, 2020, made mention of a recently published book titled Nature's Best Hope, a new approach to conservation that starts in your backyard. The author is Douglas Tallamy, and the publisher is Timber Press. It was, or still is, on the New York Times bestsellers list. I have not read the book, but I applaud its effort. And if indeed it is a bestseller, more power to it. However, the idea is not new. I can pull several books written in English or Dutch off my shelves. The Wildlife Garden by John Dennis lays next to me. Going down the chapter titles, it covers a lot of topics. Planting for wildlife. Water, key to more wildlife. Food plants for birds. Nesting sites for birds. Hummingbirds and how to track them. Entertaining the mammals. Bees, our best friends among the insects. Butterflies and their flowers. Welcome visitors among the moths, the other insects, earthworms, and richers of the soil. And misunderstood reptiles and amphibians. There's a lot of wisdom in those 12 chapters. 
I can surely recommend you read it. And then after reading it, doing something about it by tearing out half your lawn and start planting for habitat. Just like the book suggests and explains. What the author is stressing is that if we all did that, then our back alleys and front yards would become a linear, interconnected travel path, a corridor, and a living habitat for much wildlife to benefit. Listing the chapter titles, I remembered how more than 50 years ago, I, as a graduate student in horticulture with the landscape emphasis, took the course in ornithology. Oh, I took other courses of which they, the committee, questioned me. There was a course, Farm Wildlife Management. I jumped on it. I should have taken a course in fish management for the pond. That really would have blown their minds. But I remember the ornithology course. Why would you study birds? I pointed out that they had an extension publication listing shrubs which attracted birds. Those shrubs had berries which birds apparently loved. It concentrated on the shrubs. It did not say much of anything about birds. I wanted and needed to know more about birds. Yes, I took the course. It was a tough course, but I enjoyed it and I learned. There are many questions to ask when giving a landscape workshop. But the one question I always have asked is, in the beginning, at what height do most songbirds nest? I was surprised at the answers I got and the look on their eyes and faces. Then next, the explaining and the learning, gaining understanding on how environment interacts, and yards can be built up to create an interesting place to enjoy. Presently in conceptual landscape plan, lays on my drawing table. I will present it soon to the homeowners. They have a recently sown lawn. With a chuckle, I told them we will tear half of it out. They have not seen my ideas for their yard. And I'm fully aware they may not like it, as always, just having bought a house, a new house, in a new development, they have a limited budget. But a pool was mentioned. When I walk by my drawing table and look at what I came up with, I like it. But it is their yard. And that is why I'm presenting the concept and not presenting a finished plan. And yes, the other day I drew in the pool, but only after I had planned for wildlife habitat, keeping low maintenance in mind. With a natural corridor created by interlinking and connecting backyards, squirrels would not have to be high-wire acrobats anymore and follow the power lines along the alleys. Once they reach the edge of our hill, they are the trees to create their pathways. I watched them jump from tree to tree and travel where they want to go. They're fun to watch. The idea in the new book I mentioned earlier is a good idea. It's not new. Maybe the approach is new. But if our homes are our castles, then we often build a moat around our property or a wooden fence. Luckily, wildlife, most wildlife, can negotiate the fences. Birds fly. Many animals climb or dig. I wonder if with the lockdown and other restrictions because of the coronavirus, there will be a shift, even a small one, in our attitude to the space around us. You can make your own backyard a very attractive, safe place for your own family. For those of us who live on farms and who can look forward to family get-together near a farm pond or swimming hole on the farm, they have a safe place. It's not an issue. But for those who live in town, who live in an apartment, outer space and the greenery is important. It may be public space, 
but it should be a living environment. And by the way, most songbirds nest between four or eight feet off the ground. So that means there should be plenty of shrubbery to build nests in. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. Once more, as we go, we'd remind you of our podcast service for listening to this broadcast at your leisure anytime or for an automatic download of the broadcast to your mobile device. Either option there can be looked into at agtoday.net. Once more, that's agtoday.net. Meantime, please rejoin us here tomorrow. Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.